Hello, Will. Hello, Dr. Ron. What's going on? Not bad, not bad. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. How was how was your 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 weekend, your your break and everything? Uh spring is here, so I'm a happy person. <laughs> I'm I'm from the desert. So <laughs> me and uh <laughs> sweet and cold are, are not good friends. Right. Did you go back home or did you stay uh in Sweden? Um, I studied in Sweden, but I uh, haven't been in Israel for a very long time. Hopefully, uh, there will be some country to go to when I uh, have some time to go back. It's a okay. little mess there right now. Yeah, yeah, it's been a lot, a lot going on. Uh, just there, and it, it's it's crazy. So, well, exactly. Hopefully, everything will be 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 well um, when you you make. The I job hope so because I have a lot of research to do there. Ah, <laughs> on the schedule. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. Well, we're back, and um, it's just been, you know, it's been a lot going on uh, since the first interview, and it's so many people just from different perspectives just chimed in, and I found that many of you know, uh, used our video <laughs> to, to, you know, present whatever, you know, thoughts that they have, whether they're negative or positive. Um, but I think ultimately um, our dialogue and conversation ultimately win uh, at the end of the day and be informative and open to discussion. And I'm glad that because a couple of people hit uh, an email me and messaged me saying how they were um, that they felt good about the fact that they emailed you and you responded, you know, with questions or whatever you thought. Your yeah, yeah, absolutely. Same here. I also got a lot of emails, questions, both uh, by email and on the YouTube channel where I posted some videos. And and it's fun. I, I'm happy to talk to people, explain what I can, uh, help shed light on their or our all complex ancestry. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk to you again, of course. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't understand that the different fields of science that, you know, many, even in the, the geneticist world, you know, they're different uh, focal points. and things. Would, you, would you like to share on that, too? Because I think sometimes people think, well, geneticists, they have to know everything about this particular thing and everything that deals with the field. Would you would you like to share on that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So first of all, I'm all pro for knowing everything about everything. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> But it's not absolutely necessary uh, to uh, to get a good perspective. And that's why I'm always happy to talk to you, Will, because I feel our conversation help um, illuminate the kind of aspects that are worth knowing. So if you think about um, our understanding of origin people historically, uh, first there were mythologies and then came histories. And those histories were not written necessarily by uh, official historians because that field did not exist. Uh, but it was written by travelers, people like uh, Benjamin of Toledo or Herodotus. They just took a trip around the world with a notebook and a pencil, and they just documented everything. And those documentations are mostly accurate. And 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 we're still using them today to understand what those people you know, think and what did they eat and all these questions that it would be so much difficult to impossible for us to answer. And after these, but even these documents, it's not, it's not science. It's not a survey by any means. These people just visited major uh, countries, major cities, center. They recorded what they saw, but they did not record everything, of course. And then skip forward, we start moving into the late period, 18th, 19th century, where we start seeing the kind of science that we're familiar today. And we didn't have, of course, DNA back then, but we did have uh, historians, archaeologists, linguistics. And they all did their part. So from um, historians, for example, they would not know um, whether Semitic people arrived in Africa. They just wouldn't. There is there are no records. So no point studying that. It's likewise, archaeology, if those people took with them some kind of pottery and the, Levant, uh, the Levantine pottery is very well distinguished and it's so boring because there are no images <laughs> because... Uh, they did not want to violate any religious rules. So unlike the Greek and Mycenaean uh, 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 ceramics, which are much more colorful, much more happy. So yeah, you can potentially find these in Africa and make conclusions, but it's very difficult. And then came the linguists that traced the origin of languages and they said, yes, we can see Semitic influence in North Africa. Definitely there was some integration there. So you can see here how three different disciplines, but only one gave an answer because it's within its remit, within its 
uh, uh, specialties to answer these questions. And then skipping fast forward 100 years, then came geneticists. And we're using different tools. We're looking at the DNA of, of everybody and we're trying to identify markers, so unique mutations that can tell us this person is from here or this part of the DNA is from there. I know it because only in this part of the world we have the strongest signature of those, of those markers. And in the first days, there were the Y chromosome and mitochondrial haplogroups. So again, and those were studied by uh, Spencer Wells and, and many other people. They were collected from different people around the world. And then we saw, okay, there was lots of A's in Africa. So A, Y, y chromosomal haplogroup A is probably originated in Africa and spread from there on. And, and that's how they did these reconstructions. And then fast forward to uh, around 2000, uh, 2009, then ancient DNA chem. And it showed us how wrong those first analyses were. Some of them, <laughs> some were right. Because it allowed us for the first time to not do reconstructions anymore not have to guess what the past looks like, but actually look at the DNA of people in the past and see what they look like, you know, without any statistical uh, uh, mind-boggling uh, complex calculations that, uh, again, some of them were incorrect. So now we can see those ancient people, we can see their DNA, and now we can see, oh, okay, very simple to ask, how much do I look like those ancient people, and where mm. is my DNA came from with respect to different times and people? This is this is a mind-blowing uh, uh, technology that, that only now is being explored. And this is why you see all this excitement in the field when different ancient people are being, um, are being uh, sequenced and, and, and discovered and we can learn new things about their history. So, and of course, there are many other aspects. We can also study animals. We can study how horse uh, and how camel uh, help spread different beliefs and culture and everything. So there are many fossils of those investigations, but that's that's by large uh, the, the main fields that we're talking about when we're trying to reconstruct the past. Yeah, so let, let me ask you this, Doc. Um, is, is it, because I think that ev everyone in this modern day, we're trying to figure out different things, especially those uh, from my community. You know, you have different people, uh, African-Americans or whatnot. You know, I think they're the most... Um, People who try to discover, yeah, the most curious, yeah, yeah, who try, <laughs> try to discover certain things. And then there's others, of course, you know, the religious side um, within the Jewish community uh, that discuss and talk about, hey, you know, you have Ebos over here, you have the Limbas here. And, mm -hmm. and so now as a geneticist, when you're going and doing these discoveries, and I know that the conversation on the religious side is different, hey, there, there are Black Jews and different things like that. Um as a geneticist in the field, is is that a thought when you discover something? Is is your mind like, okay, let me put a color to these people, or is it just the research of just finding and whatever your whatever? I, I'm, I'm assuming that when you go into the field, there's a certain thing that you may be looking for. Would you want to elaborate on that? When I'm going to the field, my first hope is to find something because it's so difficult to know where to look. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was at Tel Megiddo, I went to the uh, to the sewer because I was hoping I, I will find stuff there. You know, this is where everything goes. But I found nearly nothing. I and I, in retrospect, I think because there was just not enough genetic material, organic material in whatever they dumped in there for me to recover and to leave a signal. So it was a mix of of mm -hmm. of stuff. Um, whereas where I went to the uh, people's quarter. Um, I found a lot more. And and again, I didn't think so. I, I thought this is where people sleep. But apparently, you know, just like you take your popcorn to bed <laughs> and sandwiches and whatever else. So this was where all the big finds were. So yeah, of course, they, you know, they ate in bed and, 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 and partied and near their quarters because maybe they didn't have the same sense as we do to, you know, of of of, uh, of of mice or hygiene, I don't know. But this is where all the finds were. And I, there is no way to know that until you collect it from the entire site you're spending a lot of money and only 5% of the samples have some kind of DNA traces, then only now you're, you know, use your logic to, oh, okay, now it makes sense if I think about it this way. So so that's that's the biggest challenge when I go to the field. Um, I don't have the luxury of saying, oh, okay, I only collect from these people, but not from another. You need to understand I'm collecting uh, soil samples. Yeah, sure, if we have bones, Absolutely, but we're taking all the bones we have. There is no color or anything. They all uh, have the same <laughs> gray color. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, we put it all in the machine. Sometimes stuff comes out, sometimes it's not. The, the field of phylogenetics is, if you will, the least uh, biased in, in, in that respect, because we don't know what we're going to find. It's very aimed to say, okay, I, I'll only study these people now, because you don't know what you're going to find. You can only find out after you uh, you test the samples and the bones. Right. Um, have you have you found any in your in your research, any type of findings that would lead uh, a group of people, let's say, per se, in the continent of Africa uh, back to the Levantine area, to the Levant? Have you found any any uh, people of, in, or tribes that you would you would like to share that you were 100 percent sure? Well, I, I wouldn't say 100, but you're positive that. Hey, yeah, yeah. So we we had this uh, question last time, and I was not so certain. I believe I communicated that, that there is still research ongoing. But okay. since our last conversation, I had a chance to continue in the analysis, and now I'm much more positive uh, than there are uh, people who came from Africa to the Levant and mixed with the populations and and passed on their uh, genetic material. And we see this in the genetic signature of the. Uh, uh, people that we collect from the uh, different Israelite tribes, primarily the south, so south from East Jerusalem and, and below. This okay. is where we see the African uh, components. Okay, is there, do, do you know any, would you say any tribes or would you just, just say, hey? Uh, the Israelite tribes, so we're looking at uh, the south would be uh, Judah, uh, Simon, okay. uh, Benjamin, which is very close to Judah. Mm -hmm. uh, this is when we see them. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. 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 Mm -hmm. Um, because I know that there are, are certain like the uh, um um different, and I, I guess it would be too it would, if if there's mixing going on, you have different hues and complexions of people that are coming out of that, and I think that um, and would you agree that during that time when you're dealing with nations of people, you're not just dealing with one hue or complexion of people. You know, with dealing with a nation, they function as a certain uh group of people with maybe different hues, lighter darker some even even darker and some you know would you would you would you view it that way uh absolutely but again it's worth remembering we're not dealing with nations we're barely even dealing with people we're dealing with tribes okay 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 and these are the same tribes as we see now now in in Israel in the south the bedouins mm. uh some of the palestinians these are all tribes okay uh they're not people because they may they don't have shared nationality they don't have shared mm. history they each have their own history they each have their own ceremonies of course they talk to each other they share language maybe some holidays uh maybe some symbols but but they're each keep to 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 themselves they're they're not they're they're either collaborate or in conflict but those uh, uh due to circumstances not to some kind of motivation and like hey let's try to make this place better let's try to work together that's not how they think they each work right. to empower their own tribe right. whether it means to sign treaty with another tribe that's fine but that's come from a very selfish place not some of kind of like national kind of perception like hey we're all one people like like the israelites try to do mm -hmm. and that was not obvious even to the israelites because they can see at the time they they fell apart like a frame tribe tried to pull out you you see that along the bible keep trying you know yeah. make troubles for the other ones because <laughs> because you need to understand they don't have this this sense this is a weird sense for them it's like why should we send people to die for this other tribe this makes absolutely no sense for yeah. us um are, are they gonna do the same for us yeah sure okay yeah write it down let's uh <laughs> you know <laughs> one day I'll, I'll cash it so so in that sense when they're when we switch our flip our understanding of this area as collection of tribes, that's absolutely not a problem. There will be tribes like uh, like the uh, like the Pora, which we know was was black, mm -hmm. and the uh, and the Yethro tribes and the Midianites will later join the Israelites. I mean it's it's all in the Bible. They're not right. they're not hiding it. So yeah, that absolutely makes sense. Yeah. There will be tribes that would move on with their with their herds and, and following the water and 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 trying to look for new places fighting uh moving away from war zones uh that those tribes would just move into israel and come up with their own stories and mythologies the levites were were a tribe as you know that came from from egypt right so let me let me ask you this and, and this this is perfect because it kind of segue into my next question as a geneticist are you allowed to or do you try to not bring religion into 
your discoveries? Like, it, how does that work? Does religion and genetics work together, or is it just, hey, you know, we I have to be. It, there may be some form of bias you don't want to show towards that. Like, how do you approach that if you're a religious type, you know, person? Um, religious people are uh, very well involved in genetics because it justifies their beliefs. Uh, the first geneticists in Israel were very, if you will, biased by, by religious <laughs> writings. In, in, as far as they were concerned, they were trying to prove that modern day Jews go back to Israel mm. and they were not shy about using Bible quotes. That has nothing to do with, with anything. There is no Bible quote <laughs> that can justify anything that they did. But they brought it there anyway, like Jacob seed uh, will flourish forever, blah, blah, blah. That's, that's not evidence. <laughs> but I felt that it was okay to do that. And, and they did. Um, so uh, this is not done anymore since there were a lot of criticism and since uh, the just the editorial practices changed and, and they were asked not to bring that. But of course, archaeologists would do it if this is a, a scholarly debate in the uh, how do we resolve conflicts in the description of uh, of the ark. Mm. Uh, there is different uh, descriptions there; they're not consistent with each other. Of course, you will have you'll use the Bible, but you're not allowed to justify use religious explanation to justify the course of history. So sometimes it can be difficult. But the idea is we do need to separate what is religious from what history at least in a way that would make sense to our to our peers. Right. Now, let me ask you, as far as the website, I mean, and, and I know when um, the, the website launched and everything going, you know, we had been working, uh, emailing back and forth, trying to get things set up, and it, and it, re it came together, and um, and and there was a, a lot of good information there. Like, what, what has been, I want to talk about two things, I want to talk about the positive and negative. I guess we can start with the negative first. What, from, it, from, um, from your perspective or from what you received, has there been any pushback negatively about the website uh, in, in itself? Uh, so the website is ancient DNA origins, of mm. course. And of course, there was no uh, negative whatsoever okay. at all. The only thing that uh, were disappointed is when people did not find what, what they wanted to find or not enough. Um, which, which I explained, this is an ongoing work. We're continuously uh, updating the algorithm. We just, a couple of weeks ago, we just doubled the amount of tests that are uh, publicly available. So now there are over 30 tests. When we last talked, there were less than uh, 20. Mm -hmm. so, so there are a lot more opportunities now for people to, uh, to, to find out their ancestry. There is now, uh, um, we also added this, uh, these tests for uh, Iron Age um, Africans. Okay. Very cool. We did a lot of work researching this to find out the history um, with, with, with really cool uh, historical figures that I hope everybody would go and learn about them. It's very cool history. Um, so those were the only um, negative, if you call it just disappointment. For me, it was <laughs> negative because I don't like people to be disappointed. I want people to be happy, enjoy the stories and everything. But uh, we ran a, a survey among users just to see what they like and what. And many people like the stories, like the history aspects. Uh, they like the genetics. And of course, we'll continue to improve to provide more data, more calculations. So, so it's it's really being a good journey working with the community and getting people feedback. So it's it's pretty been, been pretty cool. I know on, on on this side, I have had people reach out and and some of them kind of kind of familiar. They're kind of uh, I guess I would say junior researchers in in you know genetics and and there's an ongoing argument within the community about you know is haplo groups. Uh, you know, most authentic is it not? And, you know, and all this. Stuff. What what would you say about the haplo groups uh, versus all these other things? You know, versus the Y, and I, it's so many different perspectives and arguments about it. Uh, what 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 are your thoughts about? Is there's a there's a lot of uh, confusion, and I'm very happy you asked me because I'm I really want to clarify this. So one question that I was asked: Why do you report E one B one? Such haplo group does not exist anymore. Like because the DNA that we deal with, the ancient DNA is damaged and not always we can identify the full haplogroups. When mm -hmm. we can, we of course do, but sometimes we can, we report what we can. So the person who asked was happy, but I, I must emphasize, it's not like all Africans are E1, B1 or even A. Mm. Different African groups show different 
uh, uh, frequencies of those haplogroups. Some are R, which is the European one. Some are Js. Okay, there is actually along the whole spectra, what's really interesting is that no African group has this uniform distribution. It's like, you know, one of every uh, flavor, you know? So it's just different groups, which I found it fascinating because again, that indicates uh, uh, origins of at least of the paternal line and the, and the rich history and everything there is to discover. But I would recommend strongly avoid those kind of typings like, oh, I, I'm J, so I shouldn't not take this test, or I'm A, then I have no chance. Like, that's not how it works. <laughs> <laughs> okay? We're yeah, looking I at think the everybody's got it, yeah. There are 600,000 markers in there. Each one of them gives you a chance to possibly be the group that you want to uh, hope to be. Uh, the Y is just on the Y, y chromosome. It's kind of small and tiny. <laughs> but I think if, again within the community, that's why I'm glad you're on and you're talking about this because I think that that is the one of the main things is that uh, you know people are told certain things or whatnot about hey you know if you if you if you're J then you know you you know you you're a white guy you know <laughs> I'm just being real out there that's, that, that's just yeah, what it is. But the, I, that's I. I don't blame anyone. Well, I do blame geneticists. This is what it was done in the old days, and they just typed people by those haplogroups. They were not even E one B one by then. They were just E and J, like you said, and A, and they just made up stories on those little letters. And only when ancient DNA came and more data came, we saw, oh wait, this is a lot more mix. Okay, mm. those stories are incorrect. But nobody came out and said that because people don't like to say, oh, I was wrong. Wait, 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 wait. Um, hold on, hold on, Dr. Aaron. You saying the geneticists could be wrong and they don't want to come out and admit they were wrong? It sounds surprised. <laughs> <laughs> those oh, those are alive. I mean, let's <laughs> put it in perspective. That's why you missed the controversial, man. <laughs> uh, it's hard. To it's hard to say the truth, but you know, I, I I think it's 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 definitely good and 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 great and important that people really look at it from that perspective. So, what like when you label like it's for the term just the term African, is that just distinguishing to? Uh, is that just based off the continent of group of people, or is that just labeling a person based off because hey, you know, you within our community if you call african you you're hamite or you're not shemitic and things like that what why why the ter- why do you guys as genesis use the term african if when i use african it's in the respect of the continents okay awesome. uh, but that does not mean anything more than that because there is a huge diversity within africa with mixing from other continents and and of course rich history of mixing that we're not we don't even understand Mm-hmm. Uh, I would not use African. Uh, I, uh, I don't know about you guys. There is no you guys. There is me. Right. Uh, whether other people use it in other contexts, uh, that's uh, that depends on the person. I only use it in in respect to the continent, and it doesn't mean anything um, outside of that. The Afri- uh, people from Africa are the most diverse people in the world. It's just everything in there. Um, right. All the haplogroups, but maternal, of course, too. We only spoke about the Y chromosome. There is also the mitochondria, very, very diverse. We've got the uh, linguistic uh, diversity. We've got the Semitic components going all the way to Nigeria, including Nigeria. This is when we see the Semitic influism. Mm. Uh, it's, it's a very fun place to do genetics. Wow. So, and, and that's the thing. And I think there are also two people kind of, uh, kind of separate, almost kind of separate Israel from like, this whole African kind of continental thing. It's like, oh, now Israel is not in Africa. Or, well, what's your thoughts on? Do you do you kind of agree with that that Israel is in Africa? Or when when we go to school and we're uh, learning how cool Israel is, the the term is always we're in the intersect of three continents: Africa, mm-hmm. Asia, and Europe. So it's always intersect, always a, a, a central bus station. It's never we are here and not there. Okay. Uh, because that's the way it was. Um, this is where uh, uh, the, uh, the the Semitic languages developed, the, the, the Central Semitic, of course, which the Canaanite developed from. Uh, this is when uh, they did the uh, the pottery. There were the uh, the uh, copper production was in the Timna mine. That's a lot. Okay, that's 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 a couple of hours at least by car from <laughs> from uh, Egypt. Okay, and Egypt at, at some point, as you know, um, occupied Canaan. 
And mm -hmm. and if Egypt is in Africa, so has to be Israel with that right. respect in terms of uh, cultural and 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 other influences uh, from Egypt. And then at some point they they couldn't hold it anymore because uh, they they ran into financial difficulties. It's really hard to control something that has a desert in between you. Right. Um, and then the um, the Shasu and the Edomites took over the Timna mines, but they kept mm -hmm. sending copper to Egypt. Now when you have this kind of known relationships going on for a very long time until the the the, the mines uh, went dry of copper then you've got then you cannot neglect um, any exchange of information any exchange of genetics so those even though israel was is there is a desert which is a meaningful barrier but you know there is a ex constant exchange of of information of any kind then you cannot discount any possibility of mixture and people moving back and forth to work in the mines and everything um, so, um, yeah, we know of some practices from those mines that are being used, that were being used in the, uh, on, in the copper, uh, mines in Africa too. So again, that's, that's one more evidence of the huge exchange of information between these two regions. Yeah. I, I think it too, what you, you mentioned about mitochondrial, uh, DNA, and I know there's, again, there's people who are not educated in those areas. Would you like to just give a little small understanding or education with difference between mitochondrial and then you have the haplo groups would you want to kind of yeah, just absolutely. give a little bit of share share about that absolutely so when we speak of mitochondria we also speak of haplo groups now what we mean by haplo groups is just a series of mutations on on the uh, mitochondria that does not affect the function of the mitochondria so mm -hmm. they have no functional meaning but they cluster based on uh, ancestry and then we give those things name because just saying random pattern of mutation is is so much more difficult than just saying L, and and when you have an extra mutation in in the L, then we call it L1, and then another mutation, so we call it L2, and and over time the geneticists define these kind of branches that are independent of another, that are have some kind of you know letters number letter numbers. This is what the haplogroup group is called. If if you don't know this field and you can't, then I can understand the confusion. It's like what is this crazy zip code? <laughs> but it, this is what it is. This is a zip code on the on the mitochondrion and the Y chromosomes that's supposed to give you some sense of of geography. And if it doesn't, then it's not gonna get those those letters or name because then then it has no meaning. Um, and and you can also look for those haplogroups in ancient people and see these connections. So I can tell you that some Ashkenazi Jews have those L, which are uh, the one of the most uh, common haplogroups on, in Africans. How did it get there? Because of those events that we're now talking about of continuous exchange. Mm. So, just, so just labeling L as solely African is, is inaccurate. You've got those haplogroups everywhere because there was always this exchange. No group left uh, lived in isolations. Right. Well, so what about what about autosomal? Autos you have autosomal, and then you of course you're going to share about autosomal. Yeah. So autosomals are the most fun because these are the rest of the twenty two chromosomes, mm -hmm. um, and they inherited equally from our fathers and mothers. Okay, and they got theirs from their fathers and mother. So some people that's another confusion. They ask, how can you go far so much? if the amount of genetic material is being halved by every generation. Mm. So how can you go back? Uh, that's an excellent question. But for these people to ask this question, they should also ask, how come we don't have a trillion ancestors if we all have two parents and it's just going back and back and back? Because right. this is not how it works. What happens is that we started from a small group. Uh, those were our ancestors. And then they spread and had kids. Now, a lot of these people did not leave genetic material. So they were removed. Either they had disease or they were killed in the war or they just chose not to reproduce or they just uh, prefer their own sex. Whatever reason there may be, they did not move on their genetic material. So they cannot count in that trillion list of trillion ancestors. They're out. What happened is that the, a much smaller group continued to pass on their genes. Oh, and then they now, so that's why we don't have trillion ancestors. Now, why we are still finding signals in the ancient DNA, even though it's being halved by each generation, because once again, when people mate, they usually did it within their own tribe. And mm. when they did it with their own tribe, they're rec recycling the same genetic material. 
So it's as if time did not pass for that genetic material. Yes, it's being half, but it's the same tribe. It was duplicated again because the mom and the father are, are identical, have the identical genetic material. So you have it, but once again, you're doubling it from the other parents. So it's as if time did not pass. Yes, if we would all marry at random with different people of different ethnicity, yeah, sure, why not? Then it would be half, then we wouldn't be able to find our you know, Danish grandmother or whatever. But that's not how human behave. And this is why we can find those uh, ancient signals in the ancient DNA. There's an ongoing conversation um, with the court, within the community about uh, what's more authentic, what's more accurate, uh, autosomal haplogroups. What, from your perspective, what 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 do you what, what would you say? Well, they all they both give you uh, different forms of information. The paternal gives you one line, one paternal line, or in the case of mitochondria, one mitochondrial line that that moved on over time and sort of almost unchanged. But that's only one line. You have a lot more ancestors, uh, and if you have good technology, and we're using the uh, AI technology that that uh, that I developed then we can find those traces. And this technology is so good that we can also tell uh, the mixture with the Neanderthals and the Nisovans, and they lived 50,000 years ago. So just because it's not being well kept, just like the Y in the mitochondria, doesn't mean it cannot be recovered. It cannot be found if you have enough, if you have the good technology and enough information. Some information is so weak, which is what we show people. It's very difficult to tell in your specific case that there is any signal, but some people do get lucky just just because of their life history, which is unfortunate, unknown at this point. Well, awesome. I I I let you know a couple of people know with especially within the community that we would be having a conversation. Um, and I just ask, hey, if, do you have any questions for for Dr. Elhai? And so I have a, a couple of questions here if you want to answer. Um, and I'm okay. assuming that, I'm assuming that they probably have got taken the test on or of ordered a kid or two or something. But the question was, um, um, why aren't there any ancient DNA samples from the territory of Judah from the time of a, a thousand BC? I, I'm assuming that's probably on the on the uh, the, the, the 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 website. That's what yeah, I'm yeah. yeah, it is. But uh, I don't think thousand BC. That's that's a bit modern. What we have is much is is more ancient, if I recall correctly. Okay. Okay. But but every test has on the left side, there is a blue panel. It tells you exactly what's in this test and when and where those uh, ancient people are from. Right. Okay, let's see here. Uh... The uh, Menashe tribe is the most rich in samples. It was also the largest tribe. Okay. And it was the uh, most likely one of the first founding tribes of Israel. Despite of its name, Menashe was the son of uh, Joseph. So it's kind of came after the tribes but but uh historically this is the largest tribe wh wh wherever the israelite penetrated that mm -hmm. was most likely the first territory so it's a very important tribe uh for to understand uh, the origin of israel okay uh next question i answer just two more for the sake of time yeah. um it says uh uh dr hill i don't know if this was from the last uh interview but it says Dr. L. Hyde mentioned his discovery. He discovered uh, black for, black for Semitic. I don't know if that's a broad brush for blacks uh, word Semitic, and that he was going to uh, make some changes to the DNA results or something like that. I don't know. This person emailed you or something. I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah, we're updating the algorithms all the time, and we're about to make another major upgrade very soon. Okay. Um, so yes, stay tuned. Okay, and we will, of course, email email all users when we do that. Um, I wanted to save that big announcement to, oh. when to you, Will. When when we duplicated the number of uh, of tests, and so now we have over thirty tests. But and next we will uh, continue uh, um, improving the accuracy with the respect of the Semitic ancestry. Yes. Okay. Thank so, you for your so what what are the goal? Like I guess for, this is this question for me. So um, is there a specific um, I guess goal number reached of test that you guys are trying to get, or it's just I, whatever you discover, whatever the information comes in, uh, we test it. It's accurate. We apply it to the to, to the the website. A Ancient DNA origins, right? That's that's website. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh no, no. There is a goal. There is a goal. The okay. goal is to start from your DNA and build it backwards. 
with extreme accuracy when each time we're anchoring the results in other the ancient DNA samples as we move back over time. So we keep the speculations to minimum and we keep moving you back and back and back, adding all your ancestors, showing you all your lines. And in all these lines, we're showing you which trait you assimilated, when those traits came into you, what made you um, uh, give you ability to withstand high altitudes or, or mm. withstand uh, 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 broccoli or whatever you like to eat. <laughs> um, kind of understand how all these superpowers or diseases in some cases came into your line and, and kind of give you your, your entire history. Now, we're work. This is what, in my mind, this is what I'm working uh, towards. Okay. Uh, and it's more the more ancient DNA samples we have, and, and I collect, and other people collect and publish, then the closer we have to be able to have those, you know, uh, those branches on the tree uh, uncovered. Right, Dr. Ilhak, do you want to give? I guess give some wisdom um, on what should people look out for uh, just out here with. All because there's so much going on, on the internet with YouTube and Facebook, and you know, people are giving their opinions as experts in this area. Is there any type of suggestions you want to give or or to people when they you know listening or try to watching videos or reviewing people who are doing things on DNA that may not be their profession? Yeah, absolutely. I'm sad to see a lot of those things that you mentioned online and I'm sad to see so many people, many people are buying into it and I understand that genetic education is not something you get in high school or, or even in university and people have to pick it up on their own hopefully listening to our conversation there is a lot of charlatans are there there are companies that will take your DNA data and use it for things other than what you intended and and just be careful who you give your DNA data to and uh, when you hear people, YouTube or whatnot, telling you stories that connect everything very beautifully, just just remember to be skeptical. Life's uh, <laughs> science is hardly that that easy where everything is connect. Uh, more often we fail than we succeed. Uh, and when you hear stories about great connections with biblical people and everything, uh, just remember to be skeptical and ask how, how does this person know that? What, what evidence do they have to those statements? Um, uh, so just be on the guard. All right. With the last, with the, I guess the last couple of minutes that I have with you, I want to just ask this question. This is a, a question that is no as controversial. You've gotten in trouble about this question. I think I may have may briefly mentioned it before on the last interview, but I'm going to ask this question again. Go for it. From your research, was Arthur Kessler wrong or right about 13th tribe? He was right. He was right. There is a point that the point where he's criticized is from people who must have read the, the back of the book, but not the inside of the book. What uh, because in the inside of the book, he never said that all the Khazars converted to uh, to Judaism and became Ashkenazi Jews. What he said is that uh, uh, there was a dominant group uh, of uh, Jews who converted the Khazar kingdom to Judaism. So far, no, no, no debate on that point. And once there was a Jewish kingdom, Jews from uh, other places, primarily Iran and Italy, moved to Khazaria mixed with the population there. And then when the Mongols came and when Khazaria was uh, decimated because of the invasion of the Rus, the Russians, then they moved to places like Ukraine and, and other Eastern Europe. All that stuff was correct. But it's important to understand it's not just the Khazar. Jews, Ashkenazi Jews are not 100% Khazar. That part is incorrect. Okay, there was awesome. assimilation in Khazaria and there was assimilation in ancient Ashkenazi, which is very, very close. It's in northeastern Turkey. Now, how did the Jews exactly move to Europe? Did they go from uh, uh, north to the Black Sea or south to the Black Sea? That remains to be discovered, hopefully, in our next study. But um, even the recent study of, uh, of the Euphrates Jews from a, a burial site in Germany, 14th century Jews, they do not show Levantine signature. They show the same exact signature that I discovered of, of a mixed um, Greco-Roman Eastern European signature because Greco Romans were the exact communities that populated the south of the Black Sea. Of course, they said those Jews were, you know, exiled, but 
not so many Jews were exiled to explain it. The exile myth of the 70 uh, uh, AD of the destruction of the of the second temple, uh, th that was not an exile. They just you know took come a couple of people to move the boats, but there was not <laughs> was not a mass exodus of any kind. So at no point the Judeans left Judea. Never. Wow. So so that's that's a. Uh, it's a huge point in history that these type of historians will do anything to cover. They need to explain how uh, Ashkenazi Jews in U Eastern Europe numbered millions, 19 millions prior to the Holocaust. How did those people get there if they never left Judea? Okay, so that's what they first have to explain before anything else, and nobody can because there is no... There is, there is no evidence for that. What we do have evidence is that after 70, the supposed exile, life in Judea continued. There were farmers, yeah. there were people. We know it because when the Arab uh, conquest from in, in the sixth century, seventh century, then they, 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 they put taxes on those people. There were actually people who stayed there to pay those taxes. Mm. Um, and what most likely happen is what Shlomo San said is that these are local populations are the one who converted to Islam just because it made so much sense for them they don't want to pay taxes don't forget to pay your taxes great <laughs> for reminding everybody um and so so these people most likely converted to become the local population which is right now known as Palestinian wow Dr. L. Hackman, I really appreciate you once again. You are always a welcome on, on this show. Thank you so much. Platform. Always happy to, to and, be uh, here. I haven't been in troubles in a while, but never been. <laughs> there's never a good time for that. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, go ahead and give out the website again and and, and, and information um, and your contact or your your face, your if you got Facebook, your YouTube, give give all of that, give all that information. Yeah, um, Iran El Haik, um, Iran El Haik, one word at gmail.com. Feel free to email me. Uh, the website is Ancient DNA Origins. If you Google it, you'll find it. Um, feel free to email me if you have questions or, or ideas or suggestions. And if you find those tests useful, and if you want more tests of ancient populations in Africa, that's something it's hard, always hard to predict. But if there is an interest in tests, please email me uh, politely, not like, oh, how come you don't have any African tests? Like, come on, <laughs> come on. We're doing, we're working with what we have. Right, yeah, uh, yeah. But you can say, hey, can you guys add these tests in the future? That, that's that's much more polite and uh, possibly get a positive answer. Awesome, awesome. Now, is your YouTube functioning? Or have you been, have you uploaded anything recently on it? I know you have a lot of older videos, but I don't know if you... If you're... Yes, we, uh, we've been uploading uh, brief, uh, you can call it ad, but it's uh, brief explanations about the tests. This is on my YouTube channel. Uh, I can give you the, uh, copy the link here very quickly. Uh, I've been updating uh, this one more uh, more frequently. The last test that we put, one of the last one is uh, women warriors. Okay, so that's that's really cool because uh, that's another point that has been neglected over time. Uh, whether or not there were women warriors. Okay. Um, and of course, field being dominated by by males, the answer was, of course not. These are just misclassified uh, males that for some reason have characteristics of women. Uh, but wow. it was not until ancient DNA that we could have come up and say, uh, no, these are females, genetically females. And then the idea is like, okay, they were really women warriors. Women were not the feminine, fragile creatures who cannot hold the swords no they were they existed and they were strategists they were respected warriors judging wow. by the way they were buried with with jewels and swords and everything you just don't dump those things on on rookies <laughs> right, right. um and and there is a test for that with just the women warriors which is if you want to get your wife mother a present if, if you feel it's the right thing to do uh don't do it to jewish moms uh <laughs> i mean we already had that uh, we already know their worries. We don't need that, that test for that. But uh, otherwise, um, yeah, hope you'll enjoy that.
Well, thank you once again, Doc. And, and uh, it's been a it's been a pleasure, man, talking and and laughing and vibing with you. And once again, again, you can feel free to come on anytime. Uh, you know, if I got any questions, anything big come up, I'm gonna email you. Hey, I need to come on the show and talk about this, or you hey, you got any discoveries or anything? Hey, I need to come on the show. You know, we definitely do that. And um, um well, thank I, you it's, so much. Thank you so much. The pleasure was entirely mine. Always happy to talk to you, and I enjoy our conversations.